Our theme for today is deeper love and deeper marriage. And um, we've sung and read a lot about love this morning. And so I want you to know, I want to be sure that you know exactly what we mean when we say love. <clears throat> because you know the English language is limited. We call a lot of things love. And um, they don't all mean the same thing. But in the Greek language, there was at least four Greek words for love. The first of which is storge, it's S-T-O-R-G-E, which means literally love of the familiar. And it was used, it was used for love in families. Love for your parents, love for your siblings, those who you are familiar with and you grew up with. The second Greek word is the word eros, from which we get our English word erotic. And it was used to describe romantic love. Love that is based on the feelings and the emotions Love as something that we feel for one another. The third one is philos, which was used to describe love between friends. When you're friends with someone and you say, I love you, that meant literally, I love you as a friend. So when philos is used, that's what it meant. And then finally, the least used word in ancient Greek is the word agape, which meant a committed, unconditional love. The love of fools. Because who would ever want to love someone who doesn't love them back, right? <clears throat> But while this is the least used in ancient Greek, it is the most used in the scriptures. Agape is translated love in the New Testament, and it is used in both the Septuagint, which is the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, as well as in our Greek New Testament, it is used for God's love. And so that's what we are talking about when we tell God that we love him, when we declare that he loves us, that's what we mean. A committed, unconditional love that is not dependent on how we feel. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read from verse 22 to the end. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed it and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. 
However, each of you, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, back in the day, that used to be a very popular passage of scripture to read at weddings. And it's kind of fallen out of vogue today because of one single word that we're going to talk about in a minute. And so people prefer to use another passage of scripture that Brother Ronald read to open the service, and that is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. That says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now in this passage in our English translations, because of the limits of the English language, in some ways, many of our translations convert some of these words that we have in here to adjectives describing love. But in the Greek New Testament, every one of these we see listed in verses 4 through 7 of 1 Corinthians 13 is actually a verb. And unless you fail kindergarten English, you know, a verb denotes action. It's a doing word. And so, when we read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7, instead of saying love is patient, more accurately we should say love acts with patience. Instead of love is kind, we should say love acts with kindness. Love does that which is kind. Instead of saying love is not proud, it should be love does not act in a prideful way. Instead of saying love does not, or love is not self-seeking, it is more accurately, love does not pursue its own way. And then finally, instead of saying, love is not easily angered, more accurately, it should read, love does not get angry easily. I don't know if you caught that, but this passage here tells us what love does not what love is. It tells us how love is demonstrated, not what love says or feels. And that's important. Love is about what we do when we're talking about agape love, not about how we feel. We act in love and we trust our emotions to catch up with what we are doing, with our actions, just like any other act of faith we do. We do it in obedience to God, whether we feel like doing it or not. Otherwise, we'll be doomed to the roller coaster ride that is our emotions. Our emotions are just like the weather in the Bahamas. If you are patient enough, it's going to change. No matter how hot it is in the morning, how clear the skies are, how blue the sky is, summertime in the Bahamas, somewhere between 11 and 2, it's probably going to rain. And that's how our emotions are. You know, you can feel in the morning that you love your spouse more than anything in the world. And one small action, one little word, and you want to kill him. That's why as Christians, we can't be governed by our emotions. We have to do 
It has to be an act of our will in spite of how we feel. That's how love operates. And that's how God intended love to operate in marriage. You know, we need to restore biblical Christian marriage to its rightful place of prominence in our country, but especially in our church. I neglected to say it in the early service, but when we talk about wives, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 5, we're talking about a woman who was born female. And when we talk about husbands, we believe only a man who was born male can be a husband. That's what we believe. When I do weddings, this is a part of what I normally read in the hearing of the couple that's getting married as well as the congregation that's present. The union into which you are now about to enter is the closest and most tender into which human beings can come. It is a union founded upon mutual affection, experience, and to believe us in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a union in the Lord. Marriage is God's institution intended for the happiness and welfare of mankind. And then concerning the vows, I require and challenge you both as you stand in the presence of God to remember that love and loyalty alone will stand as the foundation of a happy and enduring home. No other human ties are more tender, no other promises more sacred than those you make today. And so when we talk about marriage, we talk about it on the level that God has placed it on, with the importance that God has placed on marriage. And so, as we look at our passage today here in Ephesians 5, I want to start with this point number one. Paul is talking to wives, and he's talking about love demonstrated through submission. Wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, many women today do not want to submit to a man. And that's why, well, that's one of the reasons why we hardly ever read Ephesians 5 at weddings anymore. You see, it goes against the grain of what our modern society teaches us about women. Women are strong, they are intelligent. They are more than capable of being their own boss. Women can do anything a man can do, and sometimes better. And they don't need a man for anything. Many Christian women wish this passage here in Ephesians 5 was not in the Bible. After all, what if I'm smarter than my husband? What if I'm more driven than my husband? What if I'm a better leader than my husband? Pastor Dave, you still expect me to submit to him? No, I don't. But God does. My expectation is for you to obey the word. But Pastor Dave, you don't know this man that I have to live with. This man leaves his shoes all over the house. He leaves his dirty clothes on the floor right next to the hamper. How am I supposed to live like that? How, what am I supposed to do about that? How can I submit to a man like that? I have one word of advice if you're in that situation. 
Go on your computer. Print out a sign. Put it on the door, on the outside, of the door to your house. And the sign should say, pick up after yourself. Your mama don't live here. I had one, one of my friends say to me, when I said that to his wife, he said, oh, she loves to pick up after me. <laughs> so, some people, they try to explain this passage away by limiting it to the church in Ephesus. They say, well, you have to understand that in Ephesus there was the cult of Diana. And the cult of Diana had shrine prostitutes. And when, when the men would come to the temple of Diana, these shrine pros prostitutes would dominate them. They would be the ones who were in charge. And so that's why Paul told the Ephesian wives to submit to their husbands. To break that culture of women dominating men in Ephesus. And so they say that's not intended for every Christian wife. So what about what he said to the husband? Is that intended for every Christian husband or just the ones in Ephesus? Of course not. Because it doesn't say Ephesian wives. It just says wives. It doesn't say Ephesian husbands, it just says husbands. And Paul doesn't address this anyplace else. Well, Peter does. And he takes it a step further. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he says, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. So not only is Peter saying submit to your Christian husband, if you have a non-Christian husband, submit to him too. Boy, you could have a mouse running across the floor in here. But what does he say? He says, by your behavior. In other words, by your submission, you would be able to win them to Christ without having to say a single word. I know why you don't come to church with me. You need to get saved. Peter said, submit to him when they see the purity and the integrity of your Christian walk, that's what will draw them to Christ. Not your nagging, not your complaining, not your criticizing. See, all my problems start because I need a man who could be the priest in my house. Then act like the priestess. Submit to that man, and then you could, you could claim the promise that Peter gives us here. Ah, getting tight, getting tight, getting tight. Let me go on, let me go on. <laughs> so, Paul begins by giving us the pattern of submissive love. Ephesians 3.22, wives, submit to your husbands, as you do to the Lord. Lord, you tell me in your word, um, I must submit. I can't do that. I, I, I can't. I can't. 
It's unbelievable, Lord, how silly this man is. <laughs> the stupidest ideas in the world come out of his mouth. Here we are. We've been married three years. We have one child and I'm pregnant with our second child. We finally got to the place where our finances are stable. We're starting to live a little more comfortably. This man goes to my brother's graduation from Bible school and comes back saying that you call him to go to Bible school. You ever heard anything stupid like that? Who goes to Bible school with a wife and two children? That's just stupid. Those words came out of my mouth. I said them with trepidation and fear. And Donna replied, I guess we're going to Georgia. She was maybe the only one who didn't think I was stupid. All my friends certainly did, even some of my family thought I was stupid. And over the years, more and more stupid ideas seemed to come out of my mouth. I went into full-time ministry, she followed me. I went into, I went, when I left full-time ministry, she followed me again. I made the mistake of going back into full-time ministry, and here she is once again. Now I'm saying I didn't have some stupid ideas that she rejected not to make me see some sense, but once I was convinced that this is what God wanted me to do, she followed. And we submit to the Lord, that's the pattern. That's the pattern. Submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. If he is Lord, then you submit to him. That's the pattern of submissive, submissive love. James says, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If you want the devil to flee from you, you begin by submitting to God. You don't begin by resisting him. You submit to God first, and then you can resist him, and he will flee. And so just like you submit to God, God calls you as wives to submit to your husbands. Oh, Pastor Dave, that's so easy for you to say. But Paul goes on. The pattern of submissive love is as you do to, do to the Lord. The reason for submissive love. And herein lies another one of the problems. For the husband, verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Paul didn't say this because it was easy, because it's not. He said it because it was possible. And when this possibility becomes a reality, then the door opens to the beauty that God intended for us in marriage. Oh, me and my husband, we equal. I think it was Miles Monroe who said, if something have two heads, we normally call it a monster. Right? There can only be one head. There's only one head of the church, and that is Christ. And there can only be one head in the home, and God has said, that's the husband. Yeah, you may be better qualified to be the head. You may have more experience. 
yet God still chose your unqualified, inexperienced husband to be the head. See, that's why submission is necessary. If he was clearly the better leader, if he was smarter than you, more educated than you, more qualified than you, more experienced than you, well, I'm not saying it'd still be easy because some of y'all still wouldn't want to do it. But just like Christ died for us, in spite of us being enemies of God, yeah, submission comes in spite of because it's what God requires. Boy, the 8.30 service was not quite as upset with me. In Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Paul writes, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Christ is the head of the church. And in the same way, the husband is the head of the wife. Whew, boy. Good thing I bring my nine. Be trouble getting out of this church today. But Paul goes on. He gives us the scope of submissive love. This hole I'm digging gets deeper. Ephesians 3.24. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in what? Some things. No. So wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Everything. Again, he didn't write this because it was easy. He wrote this because it was possible and because it was necessary. Pastor Dave, you telling me that my husband is like a ruler over me? In some ways, just like Christ is a ruler over you. But his banner over us is love, right? We're going to get to that in a minute. It's not easy putting aside your own will and submitting to your husband's dumb ideas. But if you have a husband who is following God, then that should not be as hard. But for some people, it doesn't make a difference. They just don't like the idea of anybody being head over that. See, that's why I moved to my parents' house when I was 20. And now you're telling me I got to go be back under my husband now? The late Ruth Bell Graham is the wife of Dr. Billy Graham tells this story in her book, It's My Turn. Ruth Bell, from she was a little girl, was convinced that the Lord was calling her to be a missionary to Tibet. And she writes, gently, tactfully, and persistently, I tried to suggest and then persuade Bill that perhaps he too should go to Tibet to be a missionary. It was obvious that I was the one doing the calling, not God. Weeks passed. Finally, Bill turned to me and said, do you believe that God brought us together? I did, unquestionably. In that case, Bill said firmly, God will lead me and you will do the following. 
And Ruth writes, and I have been following ever since. That's what love does. Love submits. That's the role that God has given for the wife. Not easy, but possible and necessary. Peter goes on in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. He says, For this is the way holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands. Like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Whew. I can't even get you all to smile like that. <laughs> That's okay, Pastor Dave. I need to be Sarah's daughter. That's quite all right. I don't need to be doing that. You know? Um, let me be Rebecca's daughter or something. I don't know. One time ago, let me ask you this. When you got married and you repeated your vows in, 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 in church, if you got married in church, as a woman, did you repeat the terms love, honor, and obey? Raise your hand if you did. Okay, raise your hand if you meant it. <laughs> Some of y'all only wanted to raise one finger because you only meant it like 20% out of the five, right? But yet, nobody wants to do that today. I can tell you now. Nobody wants to say that in their vows. I haven't had a single couple that I, I used to offer the option, you know, the older vows or the more modern vows. Not that the modern vows don't imply that. You know, I trick them. <laughs> but that word obey is going to cause a problem, right? But Peter says, you are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. We're going to talk about this in a moment, but if your husband truly loves you, and I want to emphasize that, if your husband truly loves you, what's the worst thing that can happen if you obey him? Boy, Pastor Dave, that's a big if. <laughs> but on the wife's part, the wife's role is to demonstrate love for her husband through submission. Scripture is clear. You won't find anything to contradict that. But don't think that husbands get off easy. Because they don't. They don't. Point number two. Husbands, love demonstrated through sacrifice. And men, as much as you think women trip up and fall down on the submission, I think just as much, maybe even more, we trip up on the sacrifice part. Ephesians 3, 25 through 33 covers the role of the husband. Paul takes three verses to deal with the role of the wife and then nine verses to deal with the role of the husband. Three times the text, roughly. 
maybe because we're stubborn and hard-headed and he had to really nail it down here. But we're expected to sacrifice everything for our wives, even to the point of giving our very lives. Because he begins by giving us the pattern for sacrificial love. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 25, husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That means he willingly allowed himself to be nailed on that cross for his church. And Paul is saying here that you should be willing to lay down your life for your wife. If you're married and how many of you would willingly lay down your life for your wife? You know, it's easy to say when you're nobody asking you to. But if the gunman come in and I, and say I could kill one of y'all, You see, it's important to demonstrate your willingness to take it this far by sacrificing the lesser things that you are called upon to sacrifice, right? And most of the time, that's where we have the struggle. You have to be willing to say, but if you look at the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13, when Paul was talking about love there, he was saying there in verse 1 when he said, if I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and don't have love, I'm just like a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. So he says, hey, if I don't have love, I say nothing. But if bring, bring that into the context of marriage, what he's saying is love is not empty words. Because tongues without love in our hearts is meaningless. And us saying I'm willing to sacrifice my life for my wife is one thing. But we demonstrate that by a love that demonstrates sacrifice. That's how we show we're willing to die if it comes to that. See, I was going to ask the question the other way. How many of you wives think your husband would lay down his life for you? Don't put your hands up. But our pattern is Christ. And Christ sacrificed everything for us. What did he tell the man who says, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go? He said, listen, foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests. Son of man got no place to lay his head. He didn't own a house. Didn't own a horse or a donkey. Palm Sunday, he had to borrow one. He had to call in a favor to have a place to eat the Passover with his disciples. He gave up everything. Not just on earth, but in heaven. He left the glory of heaven, the song says. So, when we're talking about the pattern for our love for our wives, the pattern is the greatest example that anyone could possibly have of love. Ephesians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. It'd be amazing if your wife could say that at your funeral. I submitted to this man a hundred percent in everything 
because he loved me and he gave his life for me. Say, but sister, didn't he get shoot in the back? Sound like he was running away. I don't know where that came from. Y'all were not smiling nearly as much as the 8.30 service, so. Paul goes on to give us the reason for this sacrificial love. Verse 28 to 30, in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed it and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. In Genesis chapter 2, when God caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam, and he took out a rib and formed it into a woman and brought it to Adam, this is what Adam responded with. The man says, Genesis 2, 23, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Adam was saying, this is, this person now that you have brought to me is just like my own flesh, just like my own body. And it's amazing here to give us the reason for this sacrificial love Paul takes us all the way back to Genesis, all the way back to the beginning, to the first man, the first woman. This is the pattern. Our wives are just like our own bodies, Paul says. If I love my wife, in doing so, I love myself. He says, after all, no one ever hated their own body. I know some people say they hate their body, right? But they got some psychological terms for that. That's not normal. That is absolutely not normal. Some people slash their wrists, their wrists, you know, in an attempt to commit suicide, that is not normal. It's a very serious mental condition. The normal thing is to feed and care for the body. And some of us feed and care for our body maybe a little bit too much. My coat could button, but a little tight. But two weeks ago, it couldn't button, so, yeah. The normal thing for us is to care for our bodies. After all, on this earth at least, we only got one. So unless you got a spare one in your closet, you need to take care of this one. And so Paul says, when you love your wife, it's like you love yourself. Go a little deeper on that in a moment. Let's go quickly to the scope of sacrificial love. Ephesians 3.31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. See, that's why Paul said earlier that when you love your body, I mean, when you love your wife, it's just like loving your own body. Like loving yourself. Because see, when God looks at the husband and the wife, he sees them as one. Paul here is quoting Genesis once again. Genesis 2 and 24 he's quoting. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, he shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one flesh. God sees us as one. And that's important. Because 
because he doesn't see us and anyone else as one. Husband and wife, he sees as one. That's it. Not husband and child, not wife and child, not wife and father, not husband and mother. No. It's just husband and wife. He sees in this unique relationship that he established called marriage. And if we want to experience the deeper love and the deeper marriage, this is what we're going to have to do. But you know, many of us men, we have a problem with the scope of the sacrifice. Very similar to how some women have a problem with the scope of submission. See? Because I can't sacrifice every other relationship I have for my wife. What are you asking me to do, Pastor Dave? You expect me to love my wife more than I love my mother? I can always get another wife. I only got one mother. Let me tell you, I don't think my wife would have married me if I didn't love my mother. This year is going to make five years since she passed away. I still love her. I probably love her more than I did when she was alive. Because now that I miss her, there's a lot of things about her that I didn't appreciate enough in the past that I realize now. But my love for my mother and my love for my wife is different. And if I had to choose one of those relationships as the most important, the biblical standard is my relationship with my wife is more important than my relationship with my mother. Amen. Only women clapping. <laughs> Clap down, so, so kind of soft, women in Bastaquino. <laughs> but, see, my love for my mother is different from my love for my wife, but my love for my wife is more important than my love for my mother. It doesn't mean I love my mother less. No, I loved her the same amount that I loved her all the time. But God sees my relationship with my wife as more important. Some of us, you know, we don't want to give up our night with the boys, even when our wife just had triplets. You know, when I got married, I told my boys, it's been real. <laughs> and that was before we had a single child. It's like, boy, <laughs> I like hanging out with y'all, but <sighs> that woman waiting for me home, some things she could do for me, y'all can't do. <laughs> I... I can't jeopardize that for y'all. No matter how much time I spend with y'all, y'all didn't get pretty enough. But for some of us, man, she met me going out with my boys. Now nah, she won't change me. No, she shouldn't have to change you. You, you choose to take a wife. You should understand the responsibility that comes with that. You know, it's, we quit to complain when our wife don't submit, but we don't even consider when we refuse to sacrifice. Some of us got two wives and our human wife is the second wife. Right? The first wife is our job. The first person we've been married to. 
You know, and um, it ain't enough that we forced to spend eight hours a day with that wife. But then after the eight hours up, we won't spend even more. But if our, sac our sacrifice is patterned after Christ's sacrifice, when he was on the way to that cross, nothing was more important than his church. When five o'clock come and you headed home, if you knock off at five, nothing should be more important than that person you're going home to. Peter writes to the husbands in 1 Peter 3 verse 7, husbands, in the same way be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. And then he makes this powerful statement, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Peter is telling us, telling me that my relationship with my wife affects my relationship with God. I can't expect God to answer my prayers if he is not pleased with the state of the relationship with my wife. He says, you know, you praying for your mother who's sick. You praying for the safety of your children because they traveling to the school. But your relationship with your wife, you know it ain't what it's supposed to be. Peter's saying, there's a strong possibility your prayers ain't going to be answered. Your prayers are going to be hindered because God sees you as one and yet you come in to pray to him as half. It don't work like that. Before you pray for anybody, you need to fix that relationship with your wife. Now, I'm the easiest person to live with. I get annoyed very easily. Um, when it comes to stories, I like the Reader's Digest version. Point A, point B, point C, just like a good sermon. And that's, that's all I need to know. My wife, on the other hand, is a details person. She wants to hear all the details. And when she tells you a story, you're gonna hear all the details. <laughs> you're gonna know what color the person was wearing, how their hair was fixed. And I'm, I'm kind of like, okay, okay. You know, get to the point, get to the point. Did I tell you last week about, no, 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 don't, don't worry about last week. It's like the man who got a text while he was in his office at home he got a text, pray for Joe, he was in a bad accident on the highway. So like a smart Christian, when someone asks you to pray, pray right away. And so he prayed, Lord, I don't know what the situation is with Joe other than he was in an accident. I don't know if he's, if he's hurt, but if he is, Lord, touch his body, heal him, give him a full recovery. Then he went out, to the, out of the office, went into the kitchen and told his wife, I just got a text. Joe was in an accident on the highway. Pray for him. Well, is he okay? Thank you. Did they take him to the hospital? Thank you. Which hospital they took him to? Thank you. I don't know. I got a text. Pray for Joe. He was in an accident on the highway. What about the people in the other car? Uh, were they okay? Did anybody get hurt seriously? 
I don't know. I got a text, pray for Joe. He was in a bad accident on the highway. What about his wife? Did anybody talk to his wife? Anybody talk to his parents? I don't know. I got a text. Pray for Joe. He was in a bad accident on the highway. His wife says, man, you don't know anything. She said, I know you didn't pray for Joe. But over the last almost 40 years, June makes 40 years that we've been married. I have learned to give a little bit more details. Donna has learned to settle with a little less details and maybe find somebody else who was there and get them from them. And I have learned to mute the television while she gives me all the details I don't want. There has to be balance in a husband and wife relationship. Just like there's balance in the relationship that Christ has with his church. He sacrificed himself for the church and the church submits to him in everything. He is the head, the church is the body. The same is true of the husband and wife relationship that we call marriage. Balance is needed. The wife's role is submissive love. The husband's role is sacrificial love. And when we have this kind of love in marriages, it will affect and permeate the entire church. Committed, unconditional love is the love that Jesus commands that we have for one another. That same kind of love that Paul expresses here, that he expresses in 1 Corinthians 13, that Peter expresses in 1 Peter 3. Dr. Haddon Robinson put it this way, and I close with this. Love is that thing which, if a church has it, it doesn't really need much else. And if it doesn't have it, whatever else it has doesn't really matter. I'm not saying love is all you need. I'm saying that's where it begins. Love is where it begins. And when love is present in a marriage in this way, submissive love on the part of the wife, sacrificial love on the part of the husband, there's nothing that comes your way that you can't handle together. I tell people in premarital counseling, you have to see yourself as a team, a two-person team, you know? Because your children, they will see themselves as a team. And they will certainly team up on you. They will find the weak link. That's in their, in their genetics. In their genetics, they will find the weakest link. And if you don't stand together, they will wreak havoc on you. You know, my kids, the two older ones were smart. They used to send the little cute one with the dimples. <laughs> Come and ask for everything. But God sees you as one. And that's the way you have to act. So when I love my wife with that same love that Christ has for the church, it's just like I'm loving myself. And when she submits to me with that submissive love that the church has for Christ, it's just like she's submitting to herself because we're one. And that's the standard that God has for us in marriage. Let's stand. Father, we thank you.